Welcome to Learning English from the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Today we have reports from Anna Mateo, Pete Musto, and Kelly Jean Kelly. Later on the show, Alice Bryant brings us the weekly program Ask a Teacher. And we close the show with an American story. Today, we hear the fourth and final part of Edgar Allan Poe's work, William Wilson. But first, here are Pete Musto and Anna Mateo. Some Catholic women are calling to remove the barriers that prevent them from reaching the highest positions in their church's leadership. They say women should be able to vote in major policy meetings. They want Pope Francis to act on his promise to put more women in leadership positions within his administration, known as the Holy See. And some women want to become priests. Knock, knock, who's there? More than half the church, a group of Catholic women shouted outside the Vatican on October 3rd. That was the first day of this year's meeting, or synod, of bishops from around the world. The meeting brings together some 300 bishops, priests, nuns, and other members of the church. Only about 35 are women. Not surprisingly, the position of women in the Catholic Church has been a major issue at the month-long meeting. The subject has come up in speeches on the floor, in small group discussions, and at news conferences. Only Synod Fathers are permitted to vote on the meeting's final policy suggestions. The suggestions are then sent to the Pope who will take them into consideration when he writes his own document. Others involved are non-voting observers or experts. Some of the attendees have pointed to what they say is a problem with these rules. For example, this year two men who are not officially priests are being permitted to vote as leaders of their religious orders. But Sister Sally Marie Hodgden is the leader of her religious order, and she cannot vote. I am a superior general, Hodgden told reporters. I am a sister. So in theory, you would think I would have the right to vote. The membership of female religious orders is about three times larger than that of male orders. An internet-based petition demanding that women have the right to vote at synods has collected 9,000 signatures since the start of this meeting. It is supported by 10 Catholic organizations seeking change in the church. These changes include greater rights for women and homosexuals and greater responsibilities for non-priests. If male religious superiors who are not ordained can vote, then women religious superiors who are also not ordained should vote. With no doctrinal barrier, the only barrier is the biological sex of the religious superior, the petition reads. The effort has won some powerful supporters. At a news conference on October 15th, Leaders of three major male religious orders expressed support for changes in synod rules. Leaders of the Jesuits, the Dominicans, and one branch of the Franciscans asked that women be permitted to vote in the future. Support also came from Cardinal Reinhard Marx. He is the Archbishop of Munich president of the German Bishops' Conference and one of the most influential Catholic leaders in Europe. In a speech to the Synod, Marx said the church leaders must answer the questions young people have about equal rights for women. The impression that the church, 
when it comes to power, is ultimately a male church, must be overcome in the universal church and also here in the Vatican, he said. It is high time. Five years ago, Pope Francis promised to put more women in leadership in his administration and Vatican City. Women are eligible for top positions in 50 departments, but only six hold such roles. None leads a department. In June, Francis told the Reuters News Service he had to fight resistance within the church to appoint 42-year-old Spanish reporter Paloma Garcia Ovejero. He made her deputy head of the Vatican's press office. But the Pope's critics say he is moving too slowly. Sister Maria Luisa Verzosa Gonzalez is taking part in the current synod. She thinks it is time for change, in the synod and in the wider church. The 75-year-old Spanish nun has spent her life educating the poor in Spain, Argentina, and Italy. With this structure in the synod, with few women, few young people, nothing will change. It should no longer be this way, she told Reuters. The Catholic Church teaches that women cannot become priests because Jesus chose only men to help form the religion. But supporters of a female priesthood say Jesus was just following the rules of society at the time. Kate McKelvey is the Rome-based executive director of the Women's Ordination Conference, a U.S. group. She organized the protest on the Synod's opening day. Some women feel called by God to be priests, just as men do, said McElwee. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Pete Musto. In West Africa, dancing is an important part of many family traditions. An ocean away, in the United States, a German, Jamaican, American family has made performing those dances part of their tradition. Their family name is Von Hendricks. Six years ago, two sisters and their brother formed an African dance company. They named it Ker Kalehi, which means the House of Children in Wolof, a language in Senegal. The group is based in the eastern U.S. city of Baltimore, Maryland. Its members perform in local and national festivals. They also recently set up a school to teach dance moves to others. At first, the dance company was made up of two dancers, sisters Jihan and Ayana, and their brother, Shakai, who played the drum. Soon, two younger family members joined them. Later, a sister-in-law joined the group. The family performs dances from Senegal, Mali, and Guinea, but has no family ties to those places. My grandfather was German, and my grandmother was from Jamaica, Jahan von Hendricks told VOA. She said her interest in dance started when she was a child. Her parents made her attend an African dance school. She learned a few dance moves, then taught her brother and sister. In time, the West African culture became part of who they were. My heart really is with Senegal, Jahan added. There, she said, people dance for all kinds of reasons. To play with children, to honor a woman before she is married, to mark the end of the harvest. Her brother, Shakai, 
says his heart is also with Senegal. He loves African drumming. Ever since I saw it when I was ten, I was hooked, he remembers. Performing together strengthens family ties and fuels creativity. Shakai added, Our parents knew what they were doing. They put us into this at a young age to keep us together. The Von Hendricks family uses the dance company to keep generations close. Jihan's daughter, 13-year-old Diallo, dances and plays the drum with the group. She started dancing when she was 18 months old. She says it helped her develop social skills and make friends. She likes everything about performing. The music, the costumes, and the feeling of accomplishment. Dancing is my happy place, Diallo said. The Von Hendricks share their joy and knowledge with their neighbors in Baltimore. One of their students is a 71-year-old hairstylist, Shakura El Sharif. She learned many African dances in the past, but says she likes West African dances best. I love everything about it, she says. It's like my medicine. The Von Hendricks dream is to teach more members of their community and family about West African dances and drumming. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. The Halloween holiday is October 31st. Tens of millions of children will put on costumes that night and visit their neighbors' homes. The neighbors will give them candy. Americans are expected to spend about $9 billion on Halloween this year. Most of the money is spent on costumes, decorations, and candy. The National Retail Federation estimates that more than 175 million Americans are planning to take part in Halloween activities this year. The online candy seller, CandyStore.com, looked through 11 years of data to learn which Halloween candy is most popular in each American state. The company found that Overall, Skittles, M&Ms, and Snickers are the most popular candies. The favorite candy of Texans, though, is Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. And candy corn came in first in the states of Alabama, Michigan, Idaho, and New Mexico. But children who live in Oregon may be among the luckiest in America. Larger size candy bars are a usual treat in the Northwestern state. What will children wear this Halloween? The National Retail Federation says princess, superhero, and Batman costumes are the most popular choices among kids. Adults, however, favor frightening characters like witches and vampires. Even America's animals are getting into the action. Dog and cat owners plan to dress their animal friends as pumpkins, hot dogs, and bumblebees, the retail group says. The English word foot has more than one meaning. In the United States, one meaning is a unit of measurement equal to 12 inches or 0.3 meters. We use feet 
to measure height, length, and short distances. Today's question is about when to use the plural or singular form. It comes from Wei Feng of China. I am often confused with the choice between foot and feet. How do I choose the right word in a particular situation? Hello, Wei Feng. That is a great question. For the unit of measurement, we often use the singular form even when we are talking about more than one foot. This can make things confusing for learners. Luckily, there are three easy rules that can help. Number one, when used as an adjective, we use foot, which is the singular form. Let's hear some examples. The children climbed a 15-foot tree. Here, the adjective is 15-foot, and it describes the noun tree. Here's another. I have a 10-foot ladder that you can borrow. Here, the adjective 10-foot describes the noun ladder. Notice that both 15-foot and 10-foot come before the noun and there is a hyphen between the words. A hyphen is needed when a unit of measurement acts as an adjective. Number two, when used as a noun, we use the plural form, feet. Take a listen. The tree is 15 feet high. Here, the noun is 15 feet and the adjective is high. The ladder is 10 feet tall. Here, the noun is 10 feet and the adjective is tall. Notice that the noun form does not use a hyphen. These two rules also apply to many other units of measurement. Number three, lastly, we usually use the singular form when talking about a person's height. This is an exception to the plural noun rule in number two. Here's an example. I am five foot six. This is a common way of saying, I am five feet six inches tall. However, when the person's height is an exact number of feet without inches, we use the plural form. I am five feet. He is six feet tall. The addition of tall is not required in everyday conversation. For all other meanings of foot, we use foot for the singular form and feet for the plural. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Alice Bryant. William Wilson, Part 4 As I ended the last part of my story, I was speaking of that terrible evening when I played cards with a young gentleman called Glenn Dinning. We were in the room of one of my friends at Oxford University. I had just realized that the young man, weak of mind and weakened by wine, had allowed me to win from him everything he owned. I was still trying to decide what I should do when, as I said, the wide, heavy doors of the room were suddenly opened, every light in the room went out. But I had seen that a stranger had entered, he was about my own height, and he was wearing a very fine, long coat. The darkness, however, was now complete, and we could only feel that he was standing among us. Then we heard him speak in a soft, low, never-to-be-forgotten voice, which I felt deep in my heart. 
he said, Gentlemen, I am here only to do my duty. You cannot know the true character of the man who has tonight taken a large amount of money from Mr. Glendinning. Please have him take off his coat and then look in it very carefully. While he was speaking, there was not another sound in the room. As he ended, he was gone. Can I, shall I, tell what I felt? Need I say that I was afraid, that I felt the sick fear of those who are judged forever wrong? Many hands held me, lights were brought, my friends looked in my coat. In it they found all the high cards, the valuable cards needed to win in the game we had been playing. Secretly using these cards, I could have taken the money of anyone who played the game with me. Mr. Preston, in whose room we were, then said, Mr. Wilson, this is yours. He lifted from the floor a fine, warm coat and said, We shall not look in this to prove again what we have proved already. We have seen enough. You will understand, I hope, the need for you to leave the university. At the very least, you must leave my room and leave it now. Down in the dust, though my spirit was, I might have tried to strike him for those words if, at that moment, I had not noticed something very surprising. My coat had cost more money than most men could spend, and it had been made especially for me. It was different, I thought, from every other coat in the world. When, therefore, Mr. Preston gave me the coat which he had picked up from the floor, I saw with terror that my own was already hanging on my arm, and that the two were alike in every way. I remembered that the strange being who had so mysteriously entered and left the room had had a coat. No one else in the room had been wearing one. I placed the coat offered by Mr. Preston over my own and left his room. The next morning I began a hurried journey away from Oxford University. I ran, but I could not escape. I went from city to city, and in each one Wilson appeared. Paris, Rome, Vienna, Berlin, Moscow. He followed me everywhere. Years passed. I went to the very ends of the earth. I ran in fear, as if running from a terrible sickness and Still he followed. Again and again I asked myself, Who is he? Where did he come from? And what was his purpose? But no answer was found. And then I looked with greatest care at the methods of his watch over me. I learned little. It was noticeable indeed that when he appeared now, it was only to stop me in those actions from which evil might result. But what right did he have to try to control me? I also noticed that although he always wore clothes the same as mine, he no longer let me see his face. Did he think I would not know him? He destroyed my honor at Oxford. He stopped me in my plans for getting a high position in Rome, in my love in Naples, in what he called my desire for too much money in Egypt. Did he think I could fail to see that he was the William Wilson of my schoolboy days, the hated and feared William Wilson? But let me hurry to the last scene in my story. Until now, I had not tried to strike back. He was honorable and wise. He could be everywhere, and he knew everything. 
I felt such wonder and fear of him that I believed myself to be weak and helpless. Though it made me angry, I had done as he desired. But now I wanted more and more to escape his control. As I began to grow stronger, it seemed to me that he began to grow weaker. I felt a burning hope. In my deepest thoughts, I decided that I was going to be free. It was at Rome during the Carnival of 1835 that I went to a dance in the great house of the Duke de Broglio. I had been drinking more wine than is usual, and the room seemed very crowded and hot. I became angry as I pushed through the people. I was looking, let me not say why, I was looking for the young, the laughing, the beautiful wife of old de Broglio. Suddenly I saw her. But as I was trying to get through the crowd to join her, I felt a hand placed upon my shoulder, and that ever-remembered quiet voice within my ear. In a wild anger I took him in a stronghold. Wilson was dressed as I had expected, like myself, in a rich coat of blue, Around his body was a band of red cloth from which hung a long, sharp sword. A mask of black cloth completely covered his face. You again, I cried, my anger growing hotter with each word. Always you again. You shall not hunt me like this until I die. Come with me now or I will kill you where you stand. I pulled him after me into a small room nearby. I threw him against the wall and closed the door. I commanded him to take his sword in his hand. After a moment he took it and stood waiting, ready to fight. Oh, the fight was short indeed. I was wild with hate and anger. In my arm I felt the strength of a thousand men. In a few moments I had forced him back against the wall and he was in my power. Quickly, wildly, I put my sword's point again and again into his heart. At that moment, I heard that someone was trying to open the door. I hurried to close it firmly and then turned back to my dying enemy. But what human words can tell the surprise, the, the horror, which filled me at the scene I then saw? The moment in which I had turned to close the door had been long enough, it seemed, for a great change to come at the far end of the room. A large mirror, a looking-glass, or so it seemed to me, now stood where it had not been before. As I walked toward it in terror, I saw my own form all spotted with blood, its face white advancing to meet me with a weak and uncertain step. So it appeared, I say, but was not. It was my enemy, it was Wilson, who then stood before me in the pains of death. His mask and coat lay upon the floor. In his dress and in his face there was nothing which was not my own. It was Wilson, but now it was... My own voice I heard, as he said, I have lost, yet from now on you are also dead, dead to the world, dead to heaven, dead to hope. In me you lived, and in my death see by this face which is your own, how wholly, how completely you have killed. Yourself. And that is our show. For VOA Learning English, I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks for listening. <laughs>